Our topic for this hour, as Brother John mentioned, is sea, river, and fire. What do those have in common? Well, we're going to talk about that. Our study for today was based upon one verse in Scripture. It's Isaiah chapter 43, verse 2, which we will read children. Isaiah 43, 1, we want to start there just to give us a little bit of context. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 1, which reads, But now saith the Lord that created thee of Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name. Thou art mine. We see in this verse that God first directs his message to Jacob. Jacob, we believe, represents the natural Israel. Remember the text. You own that by us of all the families of the earth. God, we know, entered into a covenant relationship with natural Israel. God redeemed them, in a sense, we might say. He declares that he is their savior. <clears throat> we see this specific declaration by God in verses 3 and 11. Again, Isaiah 43, verses 3 and 11, where we read in parts, I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. Beside me there is no Savior. God also directs his message, as we look at verse 1, to Israel. God is the one, of course, who selects spiritual Israel. He calls them to be a new creation. True spiritual Israel, Jesus and all the saints, are called in the one hope of their calling. They're called to be predestinated, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So God redeems true spiritual Israel. God is their Savior, as he expressly declares in verses four, uh, 3 and 11 that we just read. So our point is, our takeaway from verse 1, is that God makes it clear that the message that we're about to discuss applies to both Israels, both natural Israel and spiritual Israel. Verse 2. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. So here we see in verse 2 that God gets more specific about how he actually redeems or saves both Israel, both natural and spiritual. We believe that we want to look, take a look at each one of these instances. These are three separate instances. The sea, the river, the fire. So three separate instances. We believe uh, in the first part of this verse, which reads, when thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, that this is a reference to natural Israel's crossing of the Red Sea. Now, this is a long time ago. It was around 1600 B.C. So this is about 900 years before the prophet Isaiah even lived. But being a faithful servant of God, we know that Isaiah would have been well acquainted with this epic historic event that occurred in natural Israel. Now, we recall the circumstances leading up to and the crossing of the Red Sea by natural history. We recall on the 14th day of Nisan, the Lord spared the lives of Israel's firstborn. Israel's firstborn, of course, were the leaders of the nation. The very next day, Nisan 15, Israel began their exodus from Egypt toward the Red Sea en route, eventually, to the Promised Land. Now, as we recall, Pharaoh initially agreed to let Israel go. He said, take you and your herds and your flocks and get going. But then he soon changed his mind, didn't he? He got second thoughts. He now wanted Israel back. He wanted them back in the service. He realized the damage it was probably going to do to the Egyptian economy. So Pharaoh and some 600 chariots start out in hot pursuit of the natural Israelites that were headed to the Red Sea. Well, natural Israel quickly realized that they had a problem. Here behind them, chasing them, was the formidable Egyptian army. And of course, there's the Red Sea in front of them. Israel became terrified. It looked like there was no escape. It looked like they were trapped. It looks like they were doomed. 
And so they cried unto Moses. And what did Moses say to them? Moses said, fear thee not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord, and he will fight for you. So God told Moses, look up the rod and stretch it over the Red Sea and divide it and go through the Red Sea. God also provided something else here. He presumably provided a pillar of a cloud. And this pillar of a cloud is what guided the Israelites. And it also, in some measure, obscured the Egyptian army's visibility of the Israelites. So God was both leading them and he was protecting them. Now, because of the combination of the winds and the tides that were then working on this portion of the Red Sea, the sea opens up. And the Israelites then obviously were able to pass through. Within a few hours, the Red Sea closed. And of course, the Egyptians were drenched when the sea closed back up. Now, in the first part of verse 2, which reads, Thou passes through the waters, has two different meanings. First, to pass through means to cross over. But second, it also means to cover. You say, well, which is it? <laughs> cross over something is different than being covered. By it. Well, we believe that both concepts apply here. Israel crossed over the Red Sea, but they were also, as they crossed over the Red Sea, they were covered by the water. You say, well, that's Paul. But that's Paul's point. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1 and 2, Paul there says, in part, all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. And all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. So Paul was saying here in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 that the Israelites had water beside them. And it also had water above them because of what you and I know today is called the hydrologic cycle. You know, where it rains, evaporates, goes up and forms clouds, and you have this hydrologic cycle. So the seawater flanked them on both sides, and the cloud water from the pillar that God provided was above them. So they both crossed the sea, they, they crossed through the water, and they were also covered by the water. Well, the Israelites were then, we might say, fully immersed into Moses. Moses was their leader. Moses was their Head. Moses was their savior, in a sense, as the agent of God. He was their lawgiver. So when the Israelites agreed to follow Moses across the sea, they placed their salvation in the hands of Moses. They had to trust him that this action was going to work, that they were actually going to be able to escape the Egyptian army and not be drowned in the sea. Now, had they not agreed to follow Moses, they would have either most likely died or they would have been returned to bondage. In Egypt. But of course, we know because of God's ruling that neither one of them has happened. The water immersion pictures two things. It pictures, as we know, a death, and it also you know, pictures a death, a burial, but it also pictures a resurrection. It pictures a resurrection to a new life. When Israel crossed the Red Sea, they died to their old life of bondage in Egypt. They left their old life behind, as it were. And leaving their own life, their own life behind is exactly what Moses declared to them in Exodus 14 13, where we read, The Egyptians whom you have seen today, ye shall see them again no more forever. And that was a true statement. They were gone, they never went back to Egypt. So their old life of bondage, their old life of servitude to the Pharaoh and to the Egyptians ended then and there at their immersion through the sea and under the cloud. When they got to the other side of the sea, it began their new life under Moses' leadership. They pledged themselves to obey and to follow Moses. And following his leadership, we know that they soon entered into the old law covenant. Following his leadership, they built the tabernacle. And following, they follow Moses both into and out of the wilderness in terms of the east side of the Jordan. He was not permitted to cross into the west side. But they followed his leadership. 
And all of this constituted their rebirth as a nation, their development as a nation, their newness of life. And although Moses was Israel's leader, we know that God really was at the helm. God was really the one who was their savior. Moses was merely acting as God's agent. Well, this is a lesson for natural Israel, but Paul tells us that there is a lesson here for spiritual Israel. To begin with, Peter says that Moses typifies Jesus, just as Moses himself said in Deuteronomy chapter 18. But Peter says in Acts 3.22, he said, For Moses truly said unto the Father, The prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren, like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatsoever she, he shall say unto you. When you and I, as spiritual Israelites, look behind us in our lives, what do we see? We see a damn death. We see our personal, sinful, fleshly identity. That's what we see behind us. We see earthly aim. We see sin. We see dying. We see death. Those are the things that we see when we look behind us to our old life. But when we look in front of us, we see a very different picture, don't we? We see our greater than Moses. We see our antitypical Moses. We see the opportunity to follow our Savior, our leader, our, our uh, Ted, our lawgiver. We see an opportunity to escape the life that's behind us, to escape the Adamic family and the Adamic death of sin. And we see a new prospect. How do we realize this opportunity, this way out? of Adamic death. How do we see this opportunity? How do we bring it into reality? Well, we make a commitment to cross the antitypical Red Sea under the leadership of our Moses, our greater Moses. We're trusting in Jesus' sacrifice that has already been mentioned several times today. We make this full and reserved consecration. We agree to die as faith-justified human beings. And that's exactly what Paul tells us in Romans chapter 6. Verses 3 and 4. Romans 6, 3 and 4. And there Paul tells us, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. Jesus, as we all know, did not die in that damning death. He was not under the damning condemnation because his father was not at it. By following our Moses, we have the opportunity to die, not the Adamic death. You and I have the opportunity to die a sacrificial death. We have the opportunity to enter into a covenant relationship with our Heavenly Father, a covenant of sacrifice. We call this the Sarah feature of the Abrahamic covenant. What's on the other side of our Red Sea, the antitypical Red Sea? Well, Paul tells us this answer if we read a little further in Romans chapter 6, verse 4. The latter part of the first four says, like that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. So what's on the other side of Red Sea is newness of life. It's spirit begetto. It's life as an embryo of a new creature. At that point, God deems our former Adamic lives as dead. Remember how Paul put it. He says, our life, you, you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. So once our wills are immersed into God's will, we lose our personal identity as members of Adam's condemned family, and we become ten of members of a new family. Jesus' family, Jesus' spiritual family, members of his body, members of the body of Christ. Ten of well, let's return to verse 2, Isaiah 43, 2. When Israel passes through the waters, God says, I will be with thee. Now, God accompanied natural Israel across the Red Sea, all through the wilderness for a number of years, and then continuing on in through that wilderness journey. So God was with them through their ups and through their downs. He even stayed with them through their unfaithfulness. So the same idea in the spiritual. God is with us as we cross our antitypical Red Sea, as we enter into this baptism into Christ, into his death. 
God is committed to stay with us across the sea, and indeed, He committed Himself to be with us all through our wilderness journey in route to our Canaan. Let's consider the second instance that Isaiah mentioned in verse 2, where he says, for God says that he redeems and saves both wisdom. In the second part, the middle part of verse 2, we read, When thou passest through the river, they shall not overflow thee. Now, Isaiah here is not repeating himself. He's saying, well, sea water and river water, they're both what? But they're two completely different instances. The rivers here are not the same as the waters of the Red Sea. Now, the Hebrew word translated rivers is defined to mean stream or river, so it's very plain speak. Isaiah is not referring to the Red Sea. Israel waters experience is a totally separate one from the rivers experience. The two instances are approximately 40 years apart. Israel crossed the waters of the Red Sea at the beginning of their 40 years as they entered into the wilderness when they exited Egypt. And Israel crossed the rivers some 40 years later when they left the wilderness and entered into the promised land. Now, in their journey, which was east and then northeast and then east, as they're up going up along the east side of the Dead Sea, Israel crossed three bodies of water as they're making their journey northward. First of all, they crossed the brook Zered at the south end of the Dead Sea. Next, they crossed the Arnon River, which is about halfway up the Dead Sea on the east side. And third, they crossed the Jordan River, just a short distance north of where the Jordan River, as it flows south, empties into the Dead Sea. Now, we're not told too much about Israel's experiences when Moses led Israel over the brook Zered or the river uh, Arnon, which was in the bottom or the fall of the year. But we are told a lot more about Israel's experiences when Joshua is the one who led them over the Jordan the following spring. So we believe that the prophet Isaiah is actually referring to this crossing of the Jordan River in the spring. That's his main focus in the, that portion of verse 2. Now, Joshua tells us that at the time that Israel crossed the Jordan, it had overflowed its banks. Now, we think it's important to capture the imagery here. When Israel crossed the Jordan, you know, it was not this nice, little, calm, trickling stream. You know, we were over in Israel in the fall, and we crossed the Jordan, we were looking at the bus, and somebody said, we just crossed the Jordan. I said, where is it? It was just a little trickle in the fall. But in the springtime, as we well know, the river is swollen. It's overflowing its banks. It was flooded. It was a turbulent, fast, deep moving, and dangerous body of water to cross. That's the imagery that we want to capture here. The Jordan was swollen, not only just by the spring rains, but it was also uh, further swollen by the snow melt that was coming down from Mount Hermon, which we know is on the north end of the River Jordan. Now we know that a flooded, turbulent river can be very dangerous. In fact, just a few weeks ago, in mid-April, in this area, the flooded Ohio River ripped 26 massive barges loose from their moorings, which took quite a bit of undertaking to actually recapture uh, and regain control of those 26 barges. But that's what the river did. So we know that the river in the springtime can be very, very powerful, very dangerous. So how did this massive body of Israelites, this entire nation cross safely this dangerous torrent of water? The answer is very simple. So see, it was by divine intervention. God intervened to create a safe and a dry pathway. You know, God told Israel, uh, God told Joshua, uh, who was leading Israel, to instruct the priests to step into the Jordan and to carry the Ark of the Covenant into the middle of that river. Well, as soon as the priests bravely, they were brave, set foot in the edge of the Jordan, the upstream waters, where they had stepped in, the upstream waters stopped flowing. The suggestion has been made 
But upstream again, it's springtime. So the we bought the landslides, you know, in the springtime. The steep hillsides uh, oftentimes slip. We have a, an enormous amount of problem in this area with that. PennDOT goes crazy every year in the spring because of all these slides that they've got to deal with and repair along the roads. Well, saturated ground upstream, we believe, slid into the gorge, the river gorge, and temporarily dammed up the Jordan River. Now, as the people crossed, they could see in the distance upstream, they could see the priests and they could see the ark that the priests were holding to. Uh, and they could see that this was on dry ground. But this was upstream from it, as they crossed. Now, the word Jordan means judge down. Jor, J O R, means down, and Dan means judge. There was a test here for the natural Israelites. Whether or not the natural Israelites were going to trust the Lord and trust Joshua to bring them safely over the river was a test on them. Would they trust God? Would they trust him? Again, this is a dangerous body of water we're talking about. The Ark of the Covenant pictured God's presence, his grace, his promises, his plan of salvation, his assurances. That's what you embodied in the Ark of the Covenant. The ark and its contents represent God's plan of salvation for all mankind through Christ. The Israelites could see the ark in the midst of the Jordan that stopped this formidable torrent of water. But would they step into and cross the river in faith? Or would they doubt the Lord? And would they refrain from following Joshua across the river? Well, Joshua told them what they needed to do. He said, sanctify yourself and see the wonders that the Lord will do for you. A very similar message to what Moses had told them. In other words, consecrate yourself. Give yourselves fully over to the Lord. Trust him. But would they trust Joshua? Would they trust him that God had indeed selected him, Joshua, to orchestrate the crossing? Again, Joshua was really relatively new at this leadership role. You know, Moses had been their leader for many years, but Joshua was sort of the newbie. So would they trust him? Would they trust the Lord that he indeed was authorized and appointed by God to cross the river and to leave his place? Well, as we all know, it all worked out for Possibly some two million or more Israelites crossed over the Jordan River safely. Why? Why were the Israelites able to cross the river safely? Very simple. Because God never left them. The ark stayed in the middle of that river and kept them safe until every single one of those Israelites was safely on the other side. And then that's when the ark was brought out of the water. All this authenticated Joshua as the true leader of God, truly appointed by God. And a reliable servant of God leading the Israelites, just as you know Moses had been the leader previously. So this certainly authenticated Joshua as the God-authorized successor of Moses in terms of leading the Israelites. Just as Isaiah said in chapter 43, verse 2, the river did not overwhelm them. That's exactly what the prophet Isaiah said. The river did not sweep them away, which it certainly had the capability. Well, fleshly Israel's experiences picture similar lessons for spiritual Israel. For spiritual Israel during the gospel age. Crossing the swollen Jordan pictures our consecration. Consecration, of course, is a test. Consecration is a pivotal moment in our lives. We commit to leaving our old earthly life behind. We commit to embarking on a new journey, a new life, a spiritual journey. But you know, this new way of life can look very formidable to us. It can look scary. How do we ever overcome the weaknesses, the deeply ingrained Canaanites that have entrenched themselves so deeply in our flesh and plague us constantly? How can we ever overcome them? How can we imperfect, weak, human, mortal beings ever come off victorious? Well, that's the test. Will we forge ahead 
in our consecration and commitments, in trust and in faith? Or will we hold back, refrain and doubt and fear from giving our all? Well, we know our consecration often involves troubled and chaotic waters, difficulties, stresses, distresses, difficulties of all kinds. So how can we pass through these formidable waters and not be overwhelmed by them? The Old Testament story of Joshua and the flesh of the Israelites gives us the answer. The keys to crossing our Jordan, the keys to our overcoming, are the same things that Israel had to do, and they were instructed to do by God through Joshua. First, sanctify ourselves. Make the commitment, make that full and reserved consecration. And second, don't take our eyes off the ark. Don't take our eyes off God's promises of our safe passing. We have no reason to doubt or fear, regardless of what dangers or trouble that we may face. And sometimes that's a difficult concept to keep in mind when the trouble is ready to regret, I'm ready to endorse them. He said he will never leave us nor forsake us. And with God, as we know, there is neither variableness nor a shadow. Turning. The ark of God's presence stays in the midst of our Jordan. But we must keep it in sight. And how do we keep God's, the ark of the covenant, God's covenant, in sight? Well, we all know. It's through study, it's through dialogue, one with another. It's through prayer. It's through convention opportunity. These are the ways that we keep God's ark in view. Third thing is to follow Joshua's leadership. Well, who is Joshua? Who is the antitypical Joshua? Well, Paul tells us. He says in those uncertain terms in Hebrews chapter 4 that it's Jesus. Jesus is our Joshua. <coughs> Jesus has clearly demonstrated that he can and he should be trusted as God's appointed leader. He proved faithful unto death. Do you know how we know that Jesus proved faithful unto death? Well, there are many reasons. We have many proofs available to us and within our reach. But there's one in particular that we'll, we'll touch on. Did you know that our faithful Lord wrote a book? Yeah, he wrote a book. And each of us has read or studied some or parts or all of that book. What is that book? We know it's the book of Revelation. More declared and specifically declared in Revelation 1 1 that this was the revelation of Jesus Christ. God gave Jesus the book of Revelation from writing. And Jesus did that. He faithfully followed out his father's instruction. And then he gave it to an angel. And what did the angel do with this book? He encoded it. In other words, he put it in signs. Signs because of the, the need to actually create a, a book of symbols. And then, of course, uh, the angel gave it to John, who then shares it with the church, all seven stages of the church. So Jesus not only wrote the book, but he did something else with this book. He not only was the authorized author of God for it, but he did something else. And what is that something else? He proved worthy to unseal it. What does that mean, to unseal the book? It means to impart understanding. There was understanding as it needed to be unsealed to the, each of the seven stages of the church. And of course, we now living in the seventh stage, we have the blessings of this enormous revelation <laughs> of understanding of the mind of God, revealed mind of God. So we have every reason to follow our Joshua, every reason to follow Jesus' command, because he proved faithful. He proved that he is the authorized agent of God in carrying out his plan of salvation. So we have every reason to study him, study his life, study his uh, revelation, study his comments, his instruction. We have every reason to obey him. I mean, we have every reason to follow faithfully in his process. Now, if we sanctify ourselves, 
Make that commitment with consecration. And if we keep our eyes on the ark, the ark of the covenant, the plan of salvation, and if we follow our Joshua, we will pass over these turbulent waters safely. And these waters will not overwhelm us, even though at times I know it seems like that they will overwhelm us. But we have the absolute assurance on the highest authority that these things will not overwhelm us. God indeed will bring us off victorious. Well, let's now consider the third instance that Isaiah refers to in verse 2. <laughs> Where God declares that He redeems and He saves both Israel. Going back to verse 2, Isaiah 43, 2, the latter part of that verse, which reads, And thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. Now, unlike the Red Sea and the Jordan River experiences that happened before Isaiah's time. This one occurred roughly 200 years after Isaiah lived. So this one is Isaiah's prophecy. It's his forecast of something that was going to happen uh, in the time future from when he lives. So this is his prophecy, his forecast is what is, that we believe today and understand relates to the three Hebrews in the fiery furnace. Now, we read of this quite a bit, actually, in Daniel uh, chapters 1, 2, and 3. But we recall a story which will simply synthesize the purpose of our lesson today. Now, as an early part of the Babylonian exile of the kingdom of Judah, this was the southern of the two tribe kingdom of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar took Daniel, and he took the three Hebrews, and he carried them off to Babylon. Now, why did he do that? Well, these three, these four men were quite brilliant. They were brilliant. And I think Nebuchadnezzar recognized that he could use these people. He could really serve well the government. He could sort of enhance the quality of the Babylonian government. So Nebuchadnezzar wanted to uh, train them in the Babylonian culture and Babylonian religion and, and habits and so on to serve his government. Well, after Daniel successfully interpreted Nebuchadnezzar's dream of this giant metallic image, we recall that Nebuchadnezzar promoted not just Daniel, but he also promoted the three Hebrews to positions of responsibility uh, in the Babylonian government. Well, Nebuchadnezzar, shortly after that promotion, commanded that all people worship this giant metallic image. And we think the giant metallic image represented one of Nebuchadnezzar's heathen gods. Some suggest that this was the god to which he ascribed his military victories, would be represented by this metallic image. Well, as we know, Hebrew law, mainly the Old Law Covenant, of course prohibited the, the, uh, the Hebrews from worshiping false gods and prohibited them from worshiping idols. When Nebuchadnezzar had learned that the three Hebrews refused to worship uh, Nebuchadnezzar's heathen gods. So Nebuchadnezzar did something that was actually, you know, admirable. He interviewed the three Hebrews person. He said, I want to talk to these three men. Not just hearsay, but I want to talk to them directly. Well, during this interview between Nebuchadnezzar and the three Hebrews, the three expressly pledged their undivided loyalty to Jehovah, the God of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And they expressly denounced their any loyalty to any other gods, the heathen gods, Nebuchadnezzar's God. So Nebuchadnezzar, right then and there, pronounced the sentence. He was the judge, the jury, and the mother and the executioner. So he sentenced the three Hebrews to be bound and cremated. Cremated while they were still alive. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had become extremely angry at these traitors and ungrateful Jews. After all, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, treated them well. He gave them the best of what, what uh, Babylon had to offer. 
And he promoted them, gave them positions of responsibility in his government. And now they refuse to uh, pay loyalty to him in his love. So Nebuchadnezzar became extremely angry. So he had this furnace, this crematory, if you will, heated to its maximum. The scripture says seven times. But what it really means is he heated it to the max, maximum heat. How did they do that? Well, we believe that there was probably holes around the base of the furnace for which bellows could actually be used to pump oxygen into the fire. And of course, you know what happens when you pump oxygen into the fire? It gets enormously hot. Well, in this case, we see that uh, the three were thrown in, they were bound, hands tied, bound and thrown in to this furnace. But something very strange happened at that point. The three were not on. They were not cremated. They didn't suffer any injury whatsoever. Their clothes were not damaged. There wasn't any smell of fire on them. You know what the oddest thing was? About this experience, the ropes and the cords by which they had been bound were burned off, but it was the only thing that was burned. That was him. Amazingly, Nebuchadnezzar peeked through most likely one of these billow holes in the furnace, and he could see they were walking freely around inside this furnace, unbound, unrestrained. How could this possibly be? How could they? Not only escape harm, but actually be set free by the fire. Well, the answer is that there was a fourth party in that fire, if it wasn't. One likened to the Son of Man, the scripture said, was with them. So, once again, we see that divine providence intervenes to not only protect them, but beyond the protection to actually liberate them. God kept his promise that Isaiah prophesied. The Jews were neither blistered nor consumed by the fire. What was the key to their protection? What was the key element? We think of one word, loyalty. They declared their singular loyalty to the covenant that they had made with God, that they would not serve false gods or idols. Loyalty was the key to their, to their protection and to their uh, being liberated. They not only professed to serve God, but they professed in their covenant relationship with God to serve him and him only. And God rewarded that loyalty. Now, fortunately, Israel <laughs> picture similar lessons for you and for me, for spiritual Israel, during the God's way. The Apostle Peter said, as we might recall, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial that shall try you, as though some strange thing happened to you? Fiery trials should not be something that's strange to us. The Apostle Peter predicted it. Now we know that we should expect to have intensely difficult experiences at times, and not be surprised by them, even though they're quite difficult, very difficult. But as with the three Hebrews, sometimes we feel the intense pressure to conform to the world. You remember, Nebuchadnezzar was demanding that they conform to him, to his way of life, to his culture, to his God. And sometimes we feel the pressure to conform to the things of this world, the crowd around us. We feel pressure to bow down to the world's attitude. We feel pressure to bow down and pay homage to its ideologies, to its institutions, to its idols, to its doctrine, to its pop culture. We might even feel threatened if we don't conform to this world's demands. Bad things are going to happen to you. Well, actually, sometimes undesirable things do happen to our flesh when we refuse to conform to the world. But, friends, this lesson of the three Hebrews is not about protecting our flesh, it was about protecting theirs, but our lesson is as spiritual Israelites. This lesson is about us as new creatures in Christ Jesus. What's the lesson? Well, the lesson is the same as the Hebrews. Loyalty. Remaining loyal to the covenant of sacrifice that we have made. Not only worshiping God, but 
but carrying out our singular commitment to serve him and to serve him only. Maintaining that singular focus, maintaining our covenant loyalty to God is actually liberating for us. You know, if we compromise, we try serving the flesh and the world, and also at the same time our spiritual interests, it weakens us, it binds us. Remember how the Apostle James said that a double minded man is unstable in all ways? He's got a tough road up. He's trying to serve two different, two different lights. That's hard. But by maintaining our singular focus on this one thing I do, it releases us from the weight of serving the world and the flesh. Well, our time has nearly expired. So let's summarize what we've been endeavoring to say. Through Isaiah, God assures us that He is our Savior. He will bring us off victorious in three ways, from which we learn from this lesson. In our baptism, in our in Christ's death, if if we trust our most, He will bring us off victorious in our turbulent waters of life. If, if we keep our eyes on the ark of the covenant, and he will bring us off victorious in our fiery trials, if we remain loyal to our covenant of sacrifice, and be not conformed to the things of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds upon the things of the Spirit. Of a certainty, God will bring us off victoriously through the sea and across the river and through the fire. We leave us with 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ.